asked the Lord to raise them up again. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, it is not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. And I'm going to ask you to sing praises to the Lord. I'll probably just lip sync it this morning, but let's ask the Lord to help us as we study his word. All right, sir. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If I withdraw myself from thee, a winner shall I go, a winner shall I go. You may be seated then. Going to talk to you a little bit about keeping grace. Keeping grace. Grace that keeps you. Using the very well-known hymn, in fact, the most popular hymn in history, America, Amazing Grace, in fact, the most popular song in history, using Amazing Grace as our outline and the Bible as our source of information, we have embarked upon a short series of studies concerning the grace of God. Now, I have noted seven things thus far that John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, believed. Seven things John Newton believed, and he stated hymnologically, that is, in his hymn, through that song, Amazing Grace. Number one, obviously, Mr. Newton thinks that the grace of God is amazing. It's not ordinary. It's not common. Number two, he says that the grace of God is intended to save poor wretches, to save a wretch like me, as he saw himself to be. Number three, that to poor wretches rescued from certain doom by the grace of God, that grace of God is a sweet sound. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We never hear, never tire of uh, hearing about it or thinking about it or talking about it or studying it. Number four, the grace of God saves those who were lost and recovers sight to those who were blind. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now... I see. Number five, it is the grace of God that teaches the hard hearts of lost blind men and women. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And number six, it is that same grace that relieves those fears, and grace my fears relieved. And number seven, that the relief of those fears is only through faith. He said, how precious did that grace appear when, when I first believed, the hour I first believed. There is no appreciation of grace, or certainly not seeing it as amazing, except through faith and unless and until one is brought the faith. Then we looked at grace from a theological perspective, and I gave you a little definition from the word translated grace, and I'm going to read it for you this morning. He says that the amazing 
Grace of God is the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, comma, keeps them. Turns them to Christ and keeps them. Now, we'll look at the rest of that definition, God willing, in uh, future studies. Now, in our, in our studies thus far, we've looked at four aspects of that definition. First, that grace is the merciful kindness of God. God loved us even when we're dead in trespasses and sins, even when we were deserving of eternal death, even when we resisted the advances of the Lord by his gracious spirit in grace, he was merciful to us, and in love he wooed us. Secondly, grace we saw and have seen as the sovereign influence of God. This refers to the work of God, the spirit, upon our spirits. Just as in the beginning when God's spirit moved upon the darkness and brought light, so he moves upon our dark and dead souls to bring light in life. Then the third thing is we learn that grace teaches our hearts to fear, just as John Newton said. Having light and having life, we begin to see the great danger we are in. Now, I want to remind you that there's never a human being who sees or is concerned, really, about eternal matters before the Lord gives them light. He has to give you light for you to see that. And uh, we're very much like <clears throat> men and women in a room full of deadly reptiles, but the room is completely dark, it's black. And we're standing in the room, and we don't know that all around us are deadly reptiles that could end our lives. And then when the light is turned on, we are absolutely horrified. We are struck with horror. And it's like that when the Lord begins to awaken a soul to their lost condition. They are struck with the horror of hell and judgment with having to answer for their sins. The fourth thing we learn, though, is that grace relieves our fears. He brings our fears, he convicts us of sin, and then he relieves our fears. Using the Word of God, the Spirit turns us to our Lord Jesus as our substitute, our sin bearer, our Redeemer. And turning us to Christ, he gives us a heart to know him to serve him, and to give him glory. Now today, we're going to come to this, look at the third verse of Amazing Grace. It's in your hymnal. I forget what page it's on. I thought it was page 36. It might not be, but we're, we're glad to have you, Howie. There's Howie Smith over here. First, uh, he's been in the Marines, and I, I thought you'd probably go to Michigan, that's where your family is. We're glad to have you. I saw him uh, walk in there a few minutes ago. The third verse of John Newton's song, Amazing Grace, is like this. Through many dangers, through many toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. I was awakened by grace. I was made to fear by grace. Grace made me seek the Lord. Grace made me call upon his name. And then I was comforted by grace. Grace, my fears, relieved. And at this present hour, I am kept by grace. Of course, that agrees exactly with that theological definition of grace, Grace is the merciful kindness of God by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ and keeps them. Like Mr. Newton, I find the grace of God amazing, but it is so amazing that I can't even begin to comprehend it. 
I realize that the depths of it can never be fathomed. The height of it can never be reached. The breadth of it can never even be imagined, much less understood. To fully understand grace, I'd have to be God. The grace of God is as deep as the mind of God, as unsearchable as the secrets of God, as mysterious as the very being of God. This is what Paul meant when he said, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. Now, my friends, the bottom line is, if we're saved at all, we're saved by grace. The Bible says, uh, the song says, I once was lost, that was my original condition, but now I'm found, that's my present standing. I was blind, blinded by sin, blinded by self, blinded by Satan, but now I see. It's a miracle that I see because I was not only blind, but I was blind to my blindness. Now, I want you to turn. We've looked at this passage many times. I'd like for you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, just briefly, on our way to where I we're trying to get this morning, the Gospel of John, chapter 9. And this is the chapter about the healing of the blind man. The Bible tells us that when Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth, John chapter 9, verse 1. And his disciples are like we are. We think that all of the troubles and the trials in life are caused by something we've done, not necessarily the Lord was asked by his disciples, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? <clears throat> and Jesus said, neither this man has sinned nor his parents, that's not the cause of his blindness, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he had spoken this, verse 6, he spat on the ground, he made clay of spittle, he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which it says by interpretation means sent. He went his way, he washed, and he came seeing. Now, this man was brought, the question that's asked repeatedly in John 9 is, how, how do you now see? What did he do? Uh, what did he say? How is it possible for you to see? We rest, just read in verse 11, he, went, he, he followed I could take off here on a whole other message. Jesus went to him, and then Jesus told him to do certain things, and he was obedient. His obedience did not give him sight, but he's not going to have sight without his obedience. Can you, can you grab that? It is the Lord who gives him sight. But he said, you go, and you watch this spittle this clay off of your eyes and he did that and he came seeing they brought him to the pharisees and they asked him the very same thing verse 13 verse 13 it was on the sabbath day that they asked him verse 15 how he had received his sight and he said, well, he put clay on my eyes, I washed, and I now see. Well, then there goes into an argument about Jesus being of God and so on. So they call his parents and they ask them, verses 18 through 21. They ask his mom and dad. They went back to the blind man again. And this time he said this. After they went to his parents... They said, well, this is our son. He was born blind, but how he now sees, we couldn't tell you. He's 21. He's got his driver's license and his drinking license. Go back and ask him. 
That's what they said. Because they were afraid that they'd be thrown out of the synagogue. And in those days, if you were thrown out of the synagogue, you were thrown out of the kingdom of God. You didn't have any possibility of salvation. So now they go back to the blind man again, and they said, how is it that you now see? Notice verse 23, to substantiate what I just told you. His parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they called the blind man again, verse 24, and they said, give God the praise. We know this man's a sinner. He said, well, we, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. There's one thing I do know. I know this, brother. I was blind. Now I see. He said, I know that. <coughs> uh, of course, they wanted to know, well, what, what did he do? Verse 26. How did he open your eyes? I can't tell you today how the Lord opened my eyes. I can't tell you. I can give you a history. I can take the rest of my time this morning and tell you how I grew up and my mother, my parents took me to worship. And uh, I remember some events in Sunday school. I remember all those things. I remember being baptized when I was 12 years old in a, in a service and the preacher was preaching. His face turned red and the hoses in the side of his neck, uh, the veins in the side of his neck poked out like water hoses. I remember that. I even remember his name. His name was Costin. His last name was Costin. Everybody was boo-hooing and crying, and two or three people went down the front. And next thing I know, I was down at the front. And next thing I know, I was baptized. And then after that, lots of things happened, and now I'm a grown man. I'm married. I have a, a child, and we go to a church, small group of uh, uh, people meeting where a man was preaching, actually preaching the gospel. And uh, Lynn came to know the Lord, and we can tell you a whole story about how all that happened. And uh, I was baptized a second time in that church. And uh, the, the thing about it, after that baptism, I really did try to attend regularly and listen consistently and it was then that the Lord began to open up my mind and open up my eyes and I began to understand what a sinner was and who God was and what salvation was about. And I told the pastor that I, didn't, I wanted to confess Christ and he was shocked, so I was baptized the third time. Now those baptisms did not save me at all, but I didn't have a good conscience about the former baptisms because I was baptized in ignorance. I didn't know the Lord. I knew about being a member of a church. I knew about walking down an aisle. I knew about going to Sunday school. I had all of the experiences that people have, but I didn't know him. And the burden of these studies that I'm bringing you, and I know I'm often repetitive. I know I often repeat things. It's not from Alzheimer's. It's because I'm doing that on purpose because many times people don't hear it the first time or the second time, the third time, the fourth time. I've talked on things that I talked on 35 years ago, maybe brought a whole series of studies, and I've had people say, you know, I've never seen that before. And I've probably mentioned it hundreds of times. But the Spirit of God moves like the wind, and he moves in hearts, and he moves on souls, and he moves as he pleases. And that's what he did with me. I don't have any question at all that I was a marked man when I was born. My parents were married for over 10 years. My mother and dad were told that they could not have any children. And uh, my mother prayed like Hannah, the mother of Samuel, and said, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And after 10 years, I was born. And... Uh, didn't know it like Ralph Barnard's mother told a guy. Says, Ralph headed up this way? She said, yeah, he's not only headed that way, he's going to be preaching, but he doesn't know it yet. <laughs> well, that's all of my life. I was never told that story about my mom and my dad, but I was later saved and put into the ministry. But I couldn't tell you today how the Lord opened my eyes. 
But I do know this. He gave me an understanding that salvation is by the grace of God. And all of the grace of God is in the Son of God. And if you have the Son of God, you have the grace of God. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. He gave them, this man in John 9, gave them all the information that he had. The last time, verse 26, they said, what did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I've already told you. Verse 27, you want to be his disciples? Well, then they rebuked him. They were embarrassed because they were the Bible scholars, and he was teaching them. And then I want you to notice this. When this man was kicked out of the synagogue by the Pharisees, Jesus came back to it in verse 35. Verse 35, when Jesus heard that they had cast him out, then he came back and he found them and he said, Do you believe on the Son of God? Now I want you to understand that when this man's eyes were open physically, he still was not saved. He's not saved. You're not saved just because we've got all these healing meetings. I believe God can heal people. I believe every time you get well from a cold, the Lord heals you. I believe every time you break a bone and it gets well, the Lord heals you. The reason we're here today, how many times has he delivered us from viruses and plagues and colds and flus and pneumonias and accidents and all of these things, all of these things, the Lord does these things. I hope to show you this if we can get to it in just a minute. He does all these things to get our attention. He does these things in love and grace to make us look to him and call on him. Jesus came back and found this man, and he said, Do you believe on the Son of God? Verse 35. And this man said, Lord, who is he that I might believe on him? See, when, he, when the Lord put that mud on his eyes, he was blind. And he just put it on there and told him to go wash. He didn't see what Jesus looked like. And Jesus said to him in verse 37, You have seen him, and it is he that talks with you. And he said, I believe, verse 38. How do you know he believed? Because said he worshipped him. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Don't you worship Jesus if he's not God. Don't you worship Jesus because if he's not God, he can't save you. If he's not God, he's an imposter. If he's not God, he's not coming again. If he's not God, the whole gospel is overturned. But he is, and he worshipped him. And I want you to notice this, lastly. A lot in this verse, but don't have time this morning because of where I want to get us to. Jesus said, when that man said, I believe, and he worshipped him, Jesus said, verse 39, For judgment I have come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Do you know that it was the grace of God that enabled me to see that I couldn't see? It was the grace of God that made me conscious of my blindness. It was the grace of God that made me consciousness, conscious of my lostness. It was the grace of God that kept dealing with me all of my lives, all of my life, bringing me to the point where I was said like this man, I believe. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're my Savior. I believe you're the... All of that was by the grace of God, see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears, relieved. That's what John Bunyan said, because that's the common experience of every sinner that's ever saved. The seeking out of this blind man by Jesus was grace. The curing of this blind man's blindness was grace. The revealing of himself to the blind man was grace. 
The blind man knew something. He knew Jesus had done something for him, but he didn't know until Jesus came to him and told him who he was. Now, we've come to a very important and even critical aspect of saving grace. It's a controversial aspect. It's one that some of us sitting here today will differ on, but if I'm able to get through, I want you to hear, hear me out, hear the whole thing. If not, then I'll pick it up next week. That of security of the believer. Grace must find us. Grace must call us. Grace must open up our blinded eyes. Grace must save us. And grace must keep us. The third verse of Newton's song is this. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. How did you get through them, John? Tis grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. The Pilgrim's Progress is really the name of it. You should get a copy and read it. And in that book, he talks about our journeys to the celestial city. And I read in the Bible that many began the journey to the celestial city who didn't make it. They turned back. And remember, I'm talking to you about keeping grace. I'm talking to you about security here. Now listen to this. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, the apostle Paul wrote these words. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. That's who was with Paul. Luke, they wrote the gospel of Luke, and a guy named Demas. And he said they send Greetings with my greetings. That was in Colossians 4.14. In 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul wrote, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What happened to Demas? Was he saved and then lost? Does Jesus die for a person, shed his blood for a person, Take away all their sins. And then the devil gets them again. Well, Jesus said, I give unto them, my sheep hear my voice. They not only hear it to be saved, they hear it after they're saved. And that's how he keeps us. He keeps us by hearing his word. He keeps us by leading us along like a shepherd leads sheep. And uh, so we need to understand that there are people like Judas, for example. Judas was called to be an apostle by the Lord Jesus Christ. He was even given the ministry of treasurer. But in John chapter 6 and verse 70, Jesus said of Judas, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Judas heard Jesus teach. Judas saw the miracles. Judas ate the fish and the bread that were multiplied. Judas saw Jesus walk on the water, but he had a heart of unbelief. He was in the right crowd. He was in the right group, but he never knew him. He never knew him. Do we wonder why the hymn writer wrote, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. My friends, this old world is full of dangers, toils, and snares. And we need grace to preserve us in the midst of them and to deliver us from them. Why would Mr. Newton wrote Amazing Grace, why would he even be concerned with the dangers of the world, the toils of the flesh, and the snares of the devil? Doesn't he believe that once you're saved, you're secured forever? 
Yes, John Newton believed in the security of the believer. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, believed in the security of the believer. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher from England, believed in the security of the believer. Even Billy Graham believed in eternal security for believers. But John Newton did not believe in security for those whose lives Hear me now, whose lives continuously, constantly, forever contradicted their profession. Who said they believed but lived like they didn't. The emphasis is on the word live. A life lived only and after the flesh. I don't have momentary relapse, relapses in mind here. I know that Peter denied the Lord three times. I brought a message one time on what's the difference between Peter and Judas. They both denied the Lord. I know Peter denied the Lord three times. I know Elijah, after standing against 450 prophets of Baal, ran like a scared jackrabbit and hid in a cave when he was threatened by Jezebel. I know that David, a man after God's own heart, committed adultery with Bathsheba and then caused her husband Uriah to be killed in battle. I know that Moses, through whom God gave his holy law to Israel, was not allowed to enter the promised land because of a single act of unbelief. But I don't have temporary lapses in mind here, but lifestyles. Peter did not continuously deny the Lord. And David did not live a life characterized by sin and disobedience, and neither did Moses nor Elijah, and neither did any of the other of God's children. All of God's children are sinners saved by grace, but none of God's children are sinners who still love sin and live in their sin and die in their sin. Salvation heightens our awareness of sin and our sinfulness. You're going to find it a strange thing that as you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, you're going to see sin to be worse than you thought it was originally. You're going to see yourself to be a much bigger, bigger sinner than you thought you were. Before you die, you're going to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, in me, that is in my flesh, that dwells no good thing. It's all of grace. It must all be by his doing and not by mine. Every Christian has carnality still living in him or in her. <coughs> Every Christian displays carnality from time to time. If you don't believe that, just ask my wife. She'll verify it. Ask my son. Ask my grandchildren. But there's no such thing, there's no such animal as a Christian who continuously lives and dies in rebellion to the God who saved him. There's evidence in the Bible that God will take them out of this world before he'll let them get that far. He did it. They abused the Lord's Supper. It's in Corinthians. And Paul said, because of that, the Lord took some of you out. Because you took the Lord's Supper lightly, you, you partook of it unworthily, and the Lord took you out. <clears throat> after John Newton was found by the grace of God, after he was recovered from his blindness, then he became aware more so of the dangers and toils and snares in this world. And he knew that the grace that justified him must preserve him and lead him home safely. If I'm no longer lost, how can I live in this world? Underscore live now. How can I live continuously in this world like a lost person if I'm no longer lost? How can I sing, I once was blind, but now I see if I live like I'm still blind? 
if I'm just fine with this blinded world. If I'm no longer blind, how can I walk through this world blinded to the cause of God, blinded to the will of God, and blinded to the glory of God? If I'm a believer, how can I live like I'm not a believer? If I'm alive in Christ, how can I live like I'm dead in trespasses and sins? We need grace, my dear friends, to keep us. Because if you don't have the grace of God to keep you, they will come a time when something will draw you off course. We need grace. We need saving grace. We need awakening grace. And we need keeping grace. And this keeping grace is not merely preserving our sonship, but preserving our faith. Now hear me, there's a vast difference between a sinner being a sinner because of remaining sin in me and being a sinner because I still love sin. And when I say love sin, I don't just have in mind doing all the things out here that we have in bad minds. I mean, living your life without any concern for the will of God and the glory of God and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In all of his little stories that he told, when he told the story about the man that built his house on a rock and the man that built his house on the, on the sand, you remember that? He concluded that by saying, He that heareth my sayings and doeth them. He's not talking about saving yourself. He's talking about you want to walk through this world in an obedient spirit to him, looking in him and trusting in him. And we will do that if he doesn't keep us. There's an eternity of difference between displaying traits of carnality from time to time for which I ought to be ashamed and living a carnal and ungodly life while professing to be a child of the living God. All who enter the portals of glory will be saved by grace. Every saint is a sinner. But again, there is a world of difference between one who is a sinner because he's a member of the human race and one who is a sinner by choice. I may still be a sinner, but I'm not a sinner by choice. And I'm not a sinner by practice. Because the Lord has broken that by his grace. There's a difference between one who is painfully aware that he or she constantly falls short of the glory of God and one who embraces and lives in fellowship with the very thing that it acquired the suffering and agonizing death of the Son of God. All right, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8 now. Let me see if I can get through this. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> there are three aspects of salvation by grace. And they are inextricably linked together. Now that which is inextricable is impossible to disentangle or Separate. For example, the, uh, the present can't be separated uh, from the past. And the past and the present are inextricable. The past has led me to the present, and the present will lead me to the future. And apart from the grace of God, there will be no change in the future because the present is identical to the past. And in the same way, justification can't be separated from sanctification, and sanctification can't be separated from glorification. We're not only saved by grace. Again, I'm going to say this repeatedly, we have to be kept by grace. The same grace that saved us in the past keeps us in the present and will preserve us in the future. John Bunyan ended his book the Pilgrim's Progress, with these words. Then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gates of heaven. 
as well as from the city of destruction. The city of destruction is the world. And he said, I saw that there's a way to hell even from the gates of heaven. What in the world does that mean? Well, he means what John Newton means when he wrote that third verse. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. You know, it doesn't count in a football game when you get the ball up to the one-inch line. You got to be over the line for it to be a touchdown. Isn't that right? It doesn't count when you shoot the basketball and it bounces around the rim or rolls around it two or three times and rolls off. That doesn't count unless it goes through the net. You can hit a ball. I remember hitting a ball as a, as a guy. <clears throat> he might be watching this morning. Bobby Joyner. I hit a ball one time. Bobby wasn't in this particular game that I have in mind, but I played baseball with Bobby. He'll tell you about the time, though, that I was pitching, and he was a batter. He was a little bitty guy. He was only eight years old. And he got a hit off of me when I was 12 years old, he says. I don't remember how old I was. But in this particular game, I was at bat, and I was hitting against a fellow that was the most feared pitcher in the Little League, the eight, ages 8 to 12. And back in those days, everybody didn't make the team like they do today. You were given a number, you did a tryout, you batted, you, you pitched, you ran, you threw, and uh, those that made it were given a call, and those that didn't were given a call and told them they didn't make the team. Well, they won't do that today. Everybody gets to play. We didn't do that then. I came up to bat against this guy, and I hit the ball, and everybody was screaming because they thought it was a home run. And I thought it was a home run. But a, another friend of mine named Bill Evans was playing left field. And Bill Evans was a great baseball player. And he reached over the fence and caught the ball that I hit that I thought was a home run. Well, that was a great hit, but it wasn't a home run. <laughs> it wasn't a home run. <coughs> we are not sure and safe completely until we're in glory with the Lord. Isn't that right? Now, the Bible speaks of salvation in three tenses. Three tenses. And I've jumped a little bit ahead here on purpose because I want to show you something. You notice in Romans 8, 29 through 30, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, what I want you to see is those whom he did foreknow at the first part of this verse are the same ones that he glorified, the last word in the verse. He takes them from before the foundation of the world to the Glory of heaven. Okay? And now I want you to notice that it doesn't say for what he did for an A. It says for whom he did for an O. This is about people that he knew and loved. This is not about what he saw those people would do. Very important. Very important distinction. All right. Now having that in mind, listen to this. I said the salvation of the scriptures in three tenses. You know the three tenses, don't you? Past tense, present tense, and future tense. All right, listen to these passages. You can write them down. There's a past tense uh, salvation. That we call justification, and that is salvation from the penalty of sin. That's the removal of guilt. That's a once-for-all work done by the Lord. The passage we just read this morning reads like this, literally. For by grace have ye been saved. And that not of yourselves, that's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Titus 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, past tense, 
But according to his mercy, he saved the E.D., past tense. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So past tense is justification having to do with the penalty of sin, the guilt of sin. All right, and then we have present tense. We are being saved from the dominion of sin. That's called sanctification. The word horizo, the Greek word horizo, I'm sorry, it's not horizo. Uh, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute and tell you what it is. Horizo, pruhorizo is predestination, pre, preordained. But the word that's translated sanctify, sanctification, holy, holiness, all of those words come from one word that means to be set apart unto the Lord for his use, for his glory, according to his will. So when you are sanctified, you are called by the Spirit of God through the gospel and set apart to serve and glorify the Lord. Okay? A justification is when you're saved from the penalty of sin, past tense. Sanctification is in the present tense. I realize that the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, have to deal with this another time, that we're sanctified in Christ Jesus. I know that. That's a positional sanctification. But there's a practical sanctification that takes place in your life. And your practical sanctification gives evidence of your positional sanctification. It's like when I write a check. If I write a check and I don't have the money in the bank to back up the check, I'm writing a bad check. You understand that? So if I say I'm in Christ and I live in this world like I'm not in Christ, underscore live, not momentary relapse, not falling short, not being a carnal Christian from time to time, but not living in carnality. If I live in carnality, it gives great evidence that I don't have positional sanctification in Christ. You understand me? Practical sanctification is living out things here. It's being delivered from those many dangers, toils, and snares that John Newton wrote about in Amazing Grace. So, in being saved, I'm being saved from the dominion of sin. There cannot be a sense in which we're being saved unless we understand that we are being delivered daily and continuously from the power and the dominion of sin. In other words, we're at war. We're in a boxing match. And a lot of times we're going to get knocked down. But what are we going to do about it? We're going to get up. We're going to get up and look back to the Lord and call on the Lord and ask Him for forgiveness and come back to Him for some new cleansing in the blood of Christ. That's what we're going to do. If we ever get knocked down and knocked out, we have evidence that we really never were his. You following me? So here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness, but unto us which are being saved. It is the power of God, 1 Corinthians 1.18. 2 Corinthians 2.15, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are being saved and in them that are perishing. So there's having been saved, being saved. Thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there is future, future tense, I shall be saved. Now, before we jump into I Shall Be Saved and close this message out, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. The book of Hebrews, I'll give you time to find it. It's over about 25 pages toward the end of the Bible from where you are now. Or you can look in the table of contents and you can find the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. The book of Hebrews was written basically to Jews. There are applications in there for Gentiles too, but it's based 
basically written to Jews who had made a profession of faith that Jesus was the Messiah, and then they were going back to Judaism. And he writes them to say, don't go back, go on. Get up, just like I just said. Get up and uh, brush yourself off and get ready for new battles with the flesh and the world and the devil. Many people grow weary of it. And he's telling them, you're like somebody running a race. They're about to have the Olympics now. I've been watching some of the track and field events. And in the Olympics, they're going to, the stands are filled with people. And they're cheering on those people that are doing battle down there, those people that are racing or swimming or throwing the shot putt <coughs> or throwing the spear or whatever they're doing. They have people that are cheering them on, okay? Now, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, We are surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. So let us lay aside every weight. What would you think of a man that's going to run a 100-yard, what we just call a 100-yard dash, it's a 100-meter dash. What would you think about a guy that came out to run that and he had two weights on each ankle? So the man's crazy. You want to lighten yourself. You want to have every weight off of you so you can run as fast as you can. And this is what he's saying here. He says, get rid of all the things that hinder you from running this race toward heaven with the Spirit of God for the glory of Christ. So he says, we're surrounded with all these witnesses. These witnesses are people that have already run their race, they've finished their race, and now they're pictured as being in heaven, cheering those of us who are still here, cheering us on to finish the race. So he said, let's lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us, everything that pulls us aside, gets our attention. And let's run with patience the race that is set before us. This is a race. And you're going to have to be patient. And the older you get, the more you're going to understand how you're going to have to be patient. Then he says, while you're running this race, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. Our is not in the text, but you can read it that way. The, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand throne of God. What was that joy that set before him? The salvation of his people. He suffered willingly and joyfully for our sakes. Are we not willing to suffer willingly for his sake? Are, not, are we not willing to put away some things and put aside some things and say, in my life, Christ is going to be first. Not my work, not my family, not things I want to do, not my parties, not what I want to do, but he, I'm going to put him, he's going to be there. And we've got a world of people today that they think they're on the way to heaven because they made a decision for Jesus at some point. And meanwhile, our world is literally going to hell because people do not know the Lord. They're not running the race. And you know I'm telling you the truth. Well, when he gets down to the middle of these verse, he says, verse 3, he said, when you get tired, you get tired of fighting the battle, consider him, Jesus, and all the contradictions that he endured to save you. Lest you be wearied and faint. Lest you become so weary you say, I, I just can't go on with this. I just, I, I, I'm going back. I'm going back. Unless you faint. Faint means to quit. To faint means to quit. He said, look, let me remind you, verse 4. You haven't drawn any blood resisting sin. You think you've had a hard time or you hadn't drawn any blood resisting sin, but Christ died for sin in order to save us. And you've forgotten the exhortation. Now, here's the part about the troubles in your life. 
I believe that the Lord gives us troubles in our lives before we are saved to get our attention. But after you're saved, he's going to give you a lot of trouble for two reasons. Number one, that your faith might be proven. And number two, that you might glorify him in the midst of all the trial and trouble. There's not one, you, you read the Bible, you won't find one prophet or one believer that didn't go through all kinds of trials and troubles. What we want today is we want in the United States, we want a Savior that's just going to take us, save us and take us to, uh, 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 home to heaven when we die, but don't talk to me about all that's giving my life for Jesus and living for the Lord and living for his glory and not doing what I want to do. I want to enjoy life. I want to, I want to have a big time. I want to have a party, and then I want to go to heaven when I die. That's where we are in the United States. And it ain't going to happen. You read Pilgrim's Progress, you're going to find out that right there on the last page, John Bunyan said some of them walked up to the door of heaven and knocked on it, supposing that they were going to be let in. But he said they were totally ignorant of the salvation of God by grace in the Scripture. And so they had lived for themselves. And they thought they were going to be entered in. And they were not. There was a voice that came from within and said, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. That's sad. You know what? When I go to my grave, I don't want to have any regrets about saying, well, I stood before people and I kind of, you know, I didn't tell them the whole truth because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But I don't want the Lord to look at me and say, why didn't you tell them? Why didn't you tell them the truth? So I'm telling you the truth. It is difficult, my friends. In fact, it is impossible apart from the grace of God to live for him. I have to hurry. All right, let's look. He says, the trouble now that you're coming to. He said, you've forgotten. You said, what's this all about? I thought when I was a Christian, things are going to get better and get easier. Well, he said, you've forgotten, verse 5. You've forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as to children, my son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord and don't faint when you're rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son he receives. You're going to have trouble. If you endure the chastening, that is, if you keep going, if you press on, if you get up and dust yourself off and move forward, and you get knocked down, you get up, Dust yourself off and move forward. If you endure that chastening, God is dealing with you. You have an evidence that God is dealing with you as he deals with his sons because there's no son of God that he doesn't chasten. That is in verse 7. But if you're without chastisement, if you can live like you want to and do like you want to and be like you want to and it comes time for you to die, and you got all these terrors coming into your mind then and into your heart then. And all of these flashbacks about what you didn't do then. He says, you are the old King James uses a word we don't like today. We like to use the word illegitimates. He uses the word bastard. If you're without chastisement, if you can live after the flesh, if you can love the world, if you can chase after the world, if you can do what you want to do all of the time with your life, is evidence that you're illegitimate. You're not children of God. Now that's just about as clear as I can make it. Remember, I'm not talking about lapses. I fail every single day. Every day I fail, but I'm not going to lie there. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go back to the Lord. I'm going to say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, cover me with your blood and fill me with your spirit and give me a new strength and a new vitality to live for you. Okay? Now, 
Look at verse 12, I mean verse 14. This is why I brought you over here to listen to this. I've got to let you go. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the what? Of the grace of God. And any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and many be defiled, lest there be a fornicator like Esau, who sold his birthright from one morsel of bread. And afterward, verse 17, when he went back with tears to try to get it back, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, the Bible tells us in verse 14, listen now, People are afraid of verse 14 because they don't know what it says. Follow peace with all men and holiness. The word holy there is the word I mentioned to you earlier that means to be set apart unto the Lord. It's not talking about a degree of sinfulness or sinlessness. You're never going to get above sin as long as you're in this world. You're a sinner and I'm a sinner. I was saved a sinner and I'm still a sinner. And we need to encourage one another to get up and go on. So he says here though, unless you follow after holiness, unless you follow after, unless you want to be separated unto the Lord, used for him, serve him for his glory, for his majesty, to do his will. Then he said there's going to be many, they've made a profession of faith, they're not interested in any of the rest of it, and they are not going to be received in the glory. No man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The future tense, Romans 5, verses 9 and 10, much more now being justified. Tell you what, I'll have you, give you time to turn over to Romans 5. Let you, you can read it in your own translation. Romans Chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 9 and 10. Romans 5, verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved, future tense, from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled, past tense, to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, past tense, we shall be saved by his life. May the Lord add his blessings to the teaching of his word.